In our second video on sequences, we want to turn to the problem of how do we actually determine whether something converges or diverges. And where we left off the previous video was looking at this connection between the limit of a function as x goes to infinity and the limit of a sequence as n goes to infinity. This is going to be our crucial hook that's going to allow us to have a very large number of theorems because we have proven a ton back in Calculus 1 about the limits of functions. We know a whole bunch about that. So now that I'm faced with the question of what is the limit of a sequence, I'm going to hook it into a function and just take those limits. So for instance, some of the rules that we once had was that the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. We have that rule here, that the limit of the ANs plus or minus, doesn't matter, limit of the BNs is just going to be the limit of the sum, or minus, whichever, of the ANs and the BNs. We're also going to have a scalar multiplication rule. I can multiply by C, the C just sort of comes along for the ride, and I can factor it out. I have a multiplication rule. I can say that if it's the case that both the limit of the ANs and the limit of the BNs converge, it must be that both converge. This is only true if both converge individually then it's the case that the multiplication of these two things is just going to be equal to the multiplication of the individual values, that limit. We can do the same thing with divisibility. If it is the case that the ANs converge, and it's the case that the BNs converge, and it's the case that the BNs converge to something that's not zero, then I can take the quotient of them, and it's just going to be the limit of the quotient. And finally, one of our most important ones is that if you have a nice function, if f is continuous, then you can sort of take the limit sign and put it inside of the function. That the, the limit of any function that's continuous, say sine, the limit of sine of an is just sine of the limit of the ans. And you're able to move things around. Now, every one of these rules that we have here is, is matching a rule that we once had for just limits of functions. It's just now we're translating them into limits of sequences. Take, for example, this. We have some sequence bn, and it looks like some ridiculous mess. And we want to be able to prove that this thing converges to some value? Okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to just try to do some algebra, we're going to use some log rules, we're going to try to clean it up, and then we can use all of those rules that we had in the previous page to get our value. First, I'm going to note that this is a difference of two logs, and I have a log rule for that. So I'm going to say that this is the limit of the quotient of the first thing, the e squared n cubed plus 1, divided by the second, n cubed plus 4n squared plus 5. And what I'm going to note is that at least if it's positive, which will be the case here for, for positive n, right, the n we're considering are all positive numbers, then this ln is actually going to be a continuous function. So we can use the rule that we just saw on the previous page about how I deal with continuous functions. In this case, we're dealing with our function being equal to ln of x. So I'm going to sort of set aside the ln of x for a moment. I'm just going to focus on the inside. So if I just focus on the inside here, the limit as n goes to infinity of e squared, which is some number, times n cubed plus 1, divided by n cubed plus 4n squared plus 5, I want to use some of my algebra rules to clean this up. In particular, I'm going to divide out by n cubed. And so I'm going to say this is the limit as n goes to infinity of e squared plus 1 over n cubed, all divided by 1 plus 4 divided by n plus 5 divided by n cubed. So I was dividing the top and the bottom by n cubed. And this is exactly what we would have done if it, was, if it was x's and not n's back in calculus 1. And then if I look at these, these different terms that I have, well, 1 over n cubed, as n gets large, that's going to be going to 0. Uh, likewise, for 4 divided by n, that's going to 0. Likewise, for 5 divided by n cubed, all of those things are going to go to 0, just because 5 over x cubed goes to 0. So 5 over x cubed goes to 0, so does 5 over n cubed. And so what I am therefore left with, if all of those terms go to zero, is just e squared. And so finally, if I want to look at the limit of the bn, this is just going to be the natural log of this limit that we have here. The limit as n goes to infinity of e squared n cubed plus 1 all divided by n cubed plus 4n squared plus 5. 
And as we've just seen, this is the natural log of e squared and therefore equal to the value of 2. Now, you would have never guessed that the answer to this thing was going to be 2. Uh, we have to use a bunch of little rules to, to manipulate things, just as we would have done if this was just some messy limit where I had x's in terms of n's back in calculus 1. So in truth, these, these rules that we have, the short list, is going to allow us to figure out the convergence or divergence of an enormous number of sequences. There's one other trick that I need to show you, which is that sometimes we can make our lives easier by putting absolute values around things. And the idea here is that if the limit of the absolute value of a sequence goes to zero, then so too must the sequence without the absolute value. Indeed, if you imagine a sequence, I'll draw one, that's going to be bouncing around, up and down, up and down, something like this, but the terms are all getting closer to zero. Well, if I was just to take the, the absolute value, all of these negative ones would just be replaced with positive ones. Right? If I, I'm sort of taking the blues, and the blues would fill in here what the terms beneath the x-axis would do. And if I alternate and just consider these ones that are just now above the x-axis, clearly they're all going down to zero, just as it is if the ones that alternate up and down across the x-axis goes to zero. So it's kind of an intuitive theorem, and indeed it's going to be very helpful. For instance, uh, here I have some sequence, minus 1 to the n divided by n. And the minus 1 to the n, it doesn't very cleanly translate into a function of x. It can be done, but it's, it's a little bit messier. So I, I want to be able to just really quickly deal with this, because 1 over n is a simple sequence. 1 over n certainly converges, just as 1 over x converges, that goes to infinity, it goes to zero. So I, I want to deal with this. Now, what I'm going to note is that the absolute value of a n is just going to be equal to 1 over n, all the minus terms go away. And this is for sure going to be going to zero as our n goes to infinity. And so that implies by the theorem, that implies that the a n also goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this little theorem here is, is really nice at making our lives easier. All these things that have like minus ones to some power, I can clean them all up by just putting absolute values around them and getting them oh, getting away with all of the minus sign issues. At least if the limit of the absolute value signs goes to zero, that's my requirement. I'll also note that I've written here a little bit of a shorthand, these sort of arrows, one over n, just arrow zero, and then goes to infinity. So if you want to use the more formal limit notation, that's fine, but I'm also happy, colloquially, using this sort of arrow notation.